Our next presenter is uh, Jeremy Brown. Uh, he is the director of the Office of Emergency Care Research. He's also the NIH representative in government-wide efforts to improve emergency care. And he's also the medical officer for the Siren Emergency Care Research Network. And before that, he was the research director at George Washington University. Um, and he has been funded uh, multiple times uh, by the NIH um, uh, for renal colic. He's also been involved in an HIV screening program. And today, he's going to be talking about sort of grant mechanics and an introduction to the NIH process. So, Jeremy, please. Thank you. Okay, how's that working? All right. So I'm going to speak from down here because, like you, I am an emergency physician and I find it very hard to keep still. So I'll walk around a little bit and um, we'll see if we can get, get an understanding of grant mechanics. Now, I want to make this as interactive as possible. So, and this includes people on the East Coast who've been awake since 4 o'clock in the morning. All right, so wake up. Um, and this is our opportunity to talk together and for me to make sure that you have the very, very best possible chance of getting funding for the kind of grant that you are looking for. And I'm going to focus on NIH. Um, we heard just now that um, ARC has its own, um, uh, its own separate funding stream. It's a small funding stream compared to the NIH. Uh, it's a little bit confusing in that the grants are labeled differently. So for instance, a K08 at NIH is a basic science award. A K08 for ARC is a clinical award. So you know, there are these little bit of differences that you, you, you just have to keep your eye open so you understand exactly what's going on. But we'll focus today on the NIH, which is, which is what I know best. So, so. So when we talk about the mechanics of something, we're talking about the machinery and the working parts, right? That's what we mean by mechanics. So today we're going to talk about the machinery and the working part, and also we're going to talk a little bit, because when we talk about mechanics, mechanics is also a branch of mathematics that deals with motion and forces or opposing motion, and in fact, that's what we're also going to touch on today, the f motion and forces at work when you apply for a grant. I think um, we just heard about um, your chances at the craps tables here. I think actually that the chances, the success rate of an NIH R01 is 15%. I believe that's the, 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 the house is stacked 51-49 here, so you know, probably have a better chance um, at some of the gambling tables here than at NIH, but the difference is that this is all skill, and this is skill and perseverance, and you can have as much skill and perseverance as you like and lose a lot of money here. So. With skill and perseverance, you can really up your, up your uh, game, and I think you'll have a, uh, you know, a, a happy and successful career. So if we look first of all at um, EM submissions uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, we can see that um, you know, they, 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 they're on the uptick, is, is the takeaway from here. They're on the uptick. You mentioned um, uh, earlier some of the people who are funded, that's actually a very, very long list of emergency physicians and researchers who are funded at NIH. And then you also have to include all those people who are non-EM faculty, cardiologists, psychiatrists, pediatricians, whose research touches or is focused on the emergency department, what we call the emergency care space. They also are doing research in emergency medicine, just like emergency medicine faculty is. And so the pool is actually very large, and this is good because you can use this to find mentors, to talk to people, and to really help hone your skills and get some really good expert advice. So the take-home message is, look, you can see here the top line is the numbers that were submitted, the, 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 uh, the bottom line is the numbers that were uh, funded, so obviously many more are submitted than are funded, but, and this is important, the curve is going in the right direction. The curve is going in the right direction. Um, 
EMPIs in general, and I suspect the majority of people in the room are emergency medicine physicians, um, um, in general, the, um, you can see here that there are very different kinds of grants, right? And we're going to throw some, some names out. There's D grants and K grants and P grants. Um, um, but you can see that emergency medicine, by and large, this gra graph on the left, you can see that the majority of the grants um, uh, at the top are, um, there are some K grants at the bottom, and then the big chunk in the middle are the R grants, and then the top chunk at the top are U grants. Now, very, let's just get the terminology uh, clear. So K grants are training awards. Have any of you applied yet for a K award? Show of hands, anybody? Yes? Half, we have half an applicant. Okay, so K grants are training awards. It's not so much the research, it's the training of you as the person who is going to do the research. That's the K award. So that's the bottom layer, the red one. You can see the big chunk and the purple in the middle, those are the R awards. R are investigator initiated grants. You come to the NIH and you say, I have a brilliant idea. It's gonna revolutionize the field and I want to run the project. Please give me the money and I'll get back to you in five years with my results. Or not, I'll just publish my results. That's the R award, okay, it's, in, it's an independent, you're good to go, come back to us. Now the U awards at the top are sort of a mixture. They typically, not always, but they typically start as an R award uh, and it basically means that NIH has more of an involvement in the project. Um, so big, complex clinical trials might often start off as being submitted for an R award, but very often they're converted to a U and this means that NIH program officials People like myself and my colleagues will be in on the planning of the project, will be part of the committees that run the program, and just a little bit more involvement in the project as opposed to the R grants, which are truly, you go for it, you're, you know, you've been awarded it, it's, it's for you to, to take it from here. So those are the basic mechanisms that, that most emergency physicians use and you can see that it's also, if you look to the, to the right here, you can see that the same is true of the other, of the other um, specialties. Uh, again, majority of the R grants uh, with some U grants as well. But you can see that in terms of the amount of spending that those other specialties have, it's orders of magnitude greater than emergency medicine. Um, is there a pointy thing on this? Do we know? Is it point? Not sure. The center. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. So why do you think neurology, pediatrics, and psychiatry have orders of magnitude greater funding than emergency medicine? Are pediatricians, psychiatrists, and neurologists orders of magnitude smarter than emergency physicians? Sorry? They submit more grants, so you've got to be in it to win it less, you've got to be, they submit more grants, undoubtedly true, undoubtedly true. And there's another factor here, which is, and this is a factor that I, I truly believe is really at the bottom of this, each of these uh, subs, each of these specialties has their own institute. So there is a National Institute of Mental Health, which is where most psychiatrists submit their research applications. There is a National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, which is where most neurologists or neurologists in training or people interested in that field will, will submit their applications. And there is obviously a National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, NICHD, which supports pediatricians. So you have these institutions whose focus is on those specialties. They've been around for a long time and that is why the orders of magnitude are much, much larger for those three specialties. We do not have such an institute, nor will we ever have one, nor will we ever have one, because it will take an act of Congress to establish such an institute. And when I say it will take an act of Congress, it will literally take an act of Congress. And I use the word literally here, literally, not figurative, which is how my kids tend to use the word literally. It will literally take an act of Congress because the way that NIH is established says that NIH will consist of 27 institutes and centers. So if you want to establish a 28th, what do you have to do? 
You have to do one of two things. Convince them to add the language and the appropriations. And in this era of cutting back on government support, I don't think that's likely to happen. Or the other thing you could try and do is get rid of the other ins one of the other institutes, and then you could just slide in. Neither of those things, I think, is at all likely. So emergency medicine will not have its own institute, I believe, at least for the foreseeable future. But it doesn't mean that we are therefore stuck out uh, without any opportunities. And I think we, we have plenty of opportunities. We just have to be realistic and, and get on with it rather than just sort of walk around with a, with a sh you know, upset that they're not, there's no emergency medicine institute. Like, we have to get over it. We have to move, and we have to get, and we have to um, uh, submit. Okay, so that's a little bit of the background. Now, um, as I told you before, the R's and the K's and the U's account for most of the grants that emergency medicine physicians uh, are awarded. Again, the majority of the R grants, the investigator-initiated grants, there is a good number of K's and some R20 uh, uh, and some R21s, which are smaller planning grants, uh, as well as some U grants. Okay, so we've mentioned that the ARM grant is the largest grant. It is the grant that is used by the majority of people funded by the NIH. Um, it's investigator-initiated, meaning you come along with the idea, or it can be in response to a call. The NIH sometimes puts out requests for applications. We are seeking applications in the area of something, and then there's money there. So. Um, a good example of this, by the way, is the, um, the call that went out for research in gun violence in 2010, 2012, after the Sandy Hook massacre. Um, the administration, the Obama administration then said, listen, um, maybe NIH can do this kind of research after all. And NIH actually put out a request for people to apply for funding in the area of gun violence and gun research. Now, this is actually very, very important because until then, there was no such application. And you can see the number of people interested in getting these kind of awards in gun violence went from essentially zero, and I know this because I looked it up, zero. And as soon as that first, um, that first call for investigator-initiated projects looking at gun violence, there were 60, six zero applicants within the first cycle. 60, and, and we, the, uh, the highest scoring application was from Garen Wintermoot, who's actually, um, I think, going to be talking here or um, is running some programs here. So it makes a difference, but you can't sit back and hope that NIH is going to put out one of these requests. More generally, it's a general, um, it's a general application that says we're interested in receiving stud, uh, studies in these particular areas. Um, they're usually less than half a million dollars a year of direct costs and they last between four or five years. Um, some of the examples um, in, 20, in, in 17, um, this is Ben Sun, who's looking at um, work on um, acute MI, um, work by uh, uh, Bill Moyer um, for um, hypertension, uh, and, and there, there are plenty of others. The K23 award is, again, for career development. These are people who are in the early stages and want to be supported to become better researchers. That's what the K23 does. I want to become a better researcher. And here you get between three and five years of clinical support. And the key here is not only the project that you're doing, but it is the quality of the mentor that you name and list. So that's a very, that is as probably more important than the project that you want to do. Who is going to be your mentor? What are her, what are her credentials? Where is she located? How are you going to interact with your mentor? What is your plan? I'm going to get an MPH. I'm going to do classes in statistics. I'm going to meet with this mentor, and I'm also going to do a clinical project. So those are sort of the basic outline of what a K23 is, and it gives you um, $100,000 uh, plus fringe to support, and then other um, up to $30,000 a year in additional support that you can use to um, uh, take courses and so forth. And we have a number of K23s. Uh, Kit Delgado, who I think actually went on to get an R award, um, is uh, looking at teen uh, cell phone use, from NI and he got an award from NICHD. Um, another uh, example is this, a study looking at uh, an electroencephalography after cardiac arrest. 
So there's examples there. And finally, the R21, which is a smaller exploratory grant that is not used across all institutes of the NIH. So this is a good time to pause and remind ourselves that when I say the NIH is, or at NIH this happens, that is not really, that's a shorthand, but it's not an accurate way of describing what happens. Because the NIH consists of 27 institutes and centers, and each one does things in its entirely in its own way. You can apply for a, you, you can use a grant mechanism in one institute and think it's perfect for another institute, and they'll shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, we don't use that grant mechanism. Or, or, or something similar to that. So when I speak about the NIH, I really want you to think about the NIH as 27 institutes, neurological disorders, child health, uh, mental health, heart, lung, and blood, and so forth. There is really no single uh, NIH. Anyway, the R21 is a smaller grant, um, really supports for two years, and it is an exploratory, exploratory uh, grant that you can, um, they can use to, to, to really to generate um, some preliminary data. And these happen uh, as well. There are studies, studies looking at uh, uh, epidemiology of overdose and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And uh, Rocky Oteng from Michigan is looking at the characteristics of outcomes of traumatic brain injury uh, in a region in Ghana. So not everything has to be done within the US, although certainly the vast majority of, of work is done there. Uh, the U01, as I said, is a cooperative agreement. It's the researcher and NIH working together. Um, it's used when there's going to be what NIH calls substantial programmatic input, meaning we really want to make sure that we have a say in how this is, a joint say, we have an input into how this is going. And these are grants that can be very, very large, $20 million or more. Uh, and so really NIH wants to make sure that the, the grant is proceeding as planned and is shepherded in the right way. Uh, and we have many examples of, uh, of UO1s through, um, uh, through NIH. The SIREN grants, I don't know if you've heard about the SIREN network, we can talk about it later, but the SIREN network uh, uses U grants. Big, big clinical trials are usually done using the U grants. Okay, so now let's focus on the, um, on actually getting your project into the NIH. And again, I want you to stop me, shout out, ask me if there are clarification questions. It's a big hall with a big echo, but we can try and make this as interactive as we can, okay? So the, I, I jotted down some sort of a, a flow chart of how you actually submit a grant to NIH. And I guess what I could have done is just simply photocopy this sheet, sent it around to all you uh, guys, and then uh, we'd be done, right? But I think we need a little bit more clarification than, than these scribbles. So what I'm going to do now for the next few minutes is translate these hieroglyphics as to what you would do to get there, how you would get a grant, into a step-by-step -step guide. So first of all, your idea, your research idea. What are you going to be doing? Now, hopefully, you have generated your research idea in talking to colleagues or in uh, having a mentor who suggested to you a project that you say, hmm, that, that, that could be interesting. But of course, the, I think the best, among the best research ideas are those that you generate yourself. Um, and um, I'll use myself as an example. So many, many years ago, I was in the emergency department. I just moved to, um, I just moved to, to DC from Boston. And I was in the emergency department and um, discharging a patient with uh, kidney stone and there was a urologist in the department. I don't remember why he was there, Steve Jackman, and he suggested walk past. He gave me one of those curbside consults, which I was absolutely not interested in getting. Thank you very much. He said, well, put the patient on tamsulosin. How many people put their patients on tamsulosin for kidney stones? Let me see. Come on, put those hands up. Oh, there you go. Okay. So, Right, so you do that, right? So it's an alpha blocker, it, re it uh, relaxes the ureter, the ureteral spasm, and the stone passes quicker. Now, I had never heard of this. Never heard of this. This was back in 2005, 2004, 2005. And I'd just come from Boston. And if they don't do this in Boston, clearly this isn't a thing because Boston is the greatest place on earth for medicine, so they say. And so if people weren't prescribing tamsulosin in Boston, who was this bozo called Jackman, and why was he telling me to prescribe tansalosin for my patients? So that prompted a, a sort of a, a query in my head, 
and I came back to the um, faculty at GW and I said, you know, before the faculty meeting, let me just ask you, does any of, any of you prescribe tamsulosin for patients with renal colic? And not one hand went up. I thought maybe it was a, a geographic thing, right? Some areas of the country do one thing, areas of the country do another thing. I thought maybe it was a geographic thing. But no, none of my colleagues at GW at the time were prescribing tamsulosin. So this got me even more interested and I started doing a literature review and saying to myself, does anybody else do this? What's going on? And actually, when I started the literature review for um, this question of tamsulosin for ure ureteral colic, for kidney stones, turned out there was quite a lot of preliminary data, mostly of it going back to the 90s now, so <laughs> going back some years. The work had come out of Italy, where they had, among other things, hospitalized all their patients with ureteral stones and done k daily KUBs on them to follow the passage of the stone. This is really like prehistoric medicine. Um, and uh, from this, they concluded in these open label, um, unblinded studies that if you give patients um, tamsulosin, actually they gave them steroids as well. They gave them steroids as well because steroids reduce inflammation and irritation and swelling, so that makes sense. And this literature came out of Italy, uh, as among other places, and Steve Jackman, the, urolo the urologist, he was actually ahead of the curve, not behind the curve. I was the one who was not sufficiently educated and up with the literature, and it was he who had actually been made aware of this and was starting to examine it. But the question that I then had was, has anybody done a randomized placebo double-blind controlled trial? Because everything up until that stage was open label and done in ways that we in the United States would not do it, right? We don't admit patients with a three millimeter kidney stone to the medicine floor and do, do daily, daily KUBs until they pass the stone. It's just it's not the kind of thing we generally do. So it helped me formulate the clinical or um, basic research question, which is what is the effect of tamsulosin and steroids on the success rate of, uh, on renal colic and the success rate for passing stones? So that's an example of being faced with a clinical question, not really understanding what was going on, digging deeper and coming up with a clinical question that I later went on to be able to study in an NIH-supported trial. I told you this began around 2004, 2005. The results of the trial were published last year. That's 2018, just to give you a sense of the arc of time that takes uh, to do it. And um, oh, by the way, what were the results of the study? It doesn't help, thank you, yeah, it doesn't, it actually doesn't really help at all or appears not to help, which I was very disappointed about, um, very, very disappointed, actually, and that's now the third study, there was an Australian study and a European study that have come up with the same conclusions that it appears not to be any help at all. So, mm, at least half of you put your hands up to, uh, when I ask you if you prescribe tamsulosin for renal colic, I don't know if it's going to change your, um, the way you do things, you might want to have a journal club and look at the papers and analyze them and see if they're faulty or they persuade you, but that's the arc of how we went from this curbside consult, put the patient on tamsulosin to a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial that cost about $5 million to run and ended up being published um, over a decade later. The other places you can look to think about these questions are, of course, the NIH reporter, which you mentioned earlier, and matchmaker. You type in, a, type in keywords and press the button, and it will come up with a series of um, grants that the machine, that the NIH computer system thinks match your grant, read through them, see who's funding them, is this funded at this institute or that, who the project officer is, we'll come back and talk about the project officer in just a moment. So very interesting ways and easy ways to start and then also in the uh, website of my office, the OECR website, there should be, actually I was looking for it just now and I couldn't see where it finally landed because we've been redesigning all the web pages. There is a list of all those people who have been funded in the space of emergency medicine, uh, emergency care research that you can sort by specialty, you can sort by grant type, you can sort by year, and you can look to see who actually has been funded in this space. So there's lots of ways that you can find out who is doing work that is similar to yours, and that will give you a sense of where it can be supported uh, and who you can talk to in the area. So that starts with the idea. Now, then the question is, okay, what about the funding? Now, we heard just before a great review of why, why you need funding and where you can get it from, right? And the NIH is only one option. There are plenty of options out there, starting with none. 
What do you need the money for? Maybe you don't need any money at all. Maybe you're going to start with a, a literature review. Maybe you're going to start with a, um, a small pilot study and you have, you have the resources within your department to get some medical students or actually medical students aren't the right people to get here. They're pre-medical students that you really want to get on your side because once you're into medical school, you know, you're not interested in helping out so much anymore, right? At least that's what I've always found. But pre-med students, golden. They will do everything for you for free in return for a letter of recommendation. And they're great, and they're, it, it, it's, it's fantastic. So pre-med students are the people you really want to be um, abusing uh, for your studies here. So you may not need money at all, and that's an important thing to think about. And the advantages of not needing money are you don't need to wait. Right? And you're not required to fill out all kinds of, of you know, forms and, and, and waiting and be reviewed. So there are definitely advantages if you can pull your study off with no funding at all, at least in the preliminary stages, at least in the early stages. So one of the things I did was I did a literature review. Uh, sorry, not a review. I, I, I looked at the NAMSIS, the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey, data on how many renal colic visits there are in the U.S. that nobody had actually done that. And that was an easy first step for me to do to get some literature published on the subject to, for me to understand and help me plan my grant, but to also establish that I was actually interested in this field. So you can do uh, lots of work without, without funding, but you, may, but you may need funding, and I, and I realize that. The next thing, of course, is the um, private foundations, your hospital state funds and, and private foundations that we heard about, very, very important places that you can get work done. These are foundations that are focused on specific areas. They may be sepsis, it may be mental health, it may be, it may, it may be alcohol abuse. I mean, there's all, all kinds of foundations out there that you should turn to for help uh, in terms of getting the funding that you may need to start the project. And then the third branch is the one that we're going to focus on now, which is the NIH. Now, why would you want to get NIH funding at all, given that the success rate for R01s is around 15, 15%. Why would you want to battle those kind of odds? Well, we must be honest and say that they're prestigious awards. They are prestigious awards. They will help you with your academic career. If you bring in overheads, you'll suddenly get noticed by the chair of your department. Right? Remember, overheads are the extra money over and above the money that you bring in to your institute that goes directly into the I'm not actually sure where it goes directly into it. It sort of disappears. Uh, but it's a huge amount of money. So depending on which institute, you, which um, academic site you are in, your overhead can be anywhere from 45 to 80 percent. So for, if you have a million dollar grant, you're bringing in 1.8 million dollars to the hospital or to the academic center. That 800,000, it disappears. The dean takes it. The dean of research takes it. Everybody gets a cut. But you are generating $800,000 of revenue. I got a $4.2 million grant for my um, NIH study. And the overhead was, I think, 56% at the time. Now, I did not consume over a million dollars worth of secretarial support. I can tell you that for now. And I didn't burn through a million dollars worth of electricity keeping the three light bulbs on in my office. Right? These overheads are meant to support labs and lab space and, and the heating and, and all the stuff that it goes into to keeping a, 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 an investigator, a researcher up and, and keeping her lab going. But quite honestly, I did not use any of that money. I had no lab. I was working out of my office. So the hospital, essentially, or the, or, or the university, benefited to the tune of 56%, and it was oh, well, well, well north of a million dollars. So the hospital and the academic center and your chair will take note of you when you generate that kind of significant money. But aside from the money, they are prestigious. They're a sign that you are a serious researcher to be taken seriously. So we must acknowledge that, that they do help. They're prestigious. They can help with your academic promotion. And the substantial dollars that you can bring in terms of overheads are really very huge and might be able to give you some leveraging power in terms of figuring out your hours and how much time you're going to spend focused on your academic work versus uh, treating patients. The disadvantages are that the process is slow, takes probably a year and a half, and the success rate, as we've said, is low. So those are your pluses and minuses for the NIH. 
So what is the definition of the clinical trial? Just very, very briefly, the, this is a new sort of um, standard that the NIH wants us to think about. Um, and they have uh, four questions that you need to answer to determine whether you're doing a clinical trial. If you're not doing a clinical trial, it doesn't mean anything. It just means technically you're not doing a clinical trial. But in terms of the, of the NIH, if you answer any of these questions, uh, all of these questions, then you are technically doing a clinical trial. And these questions are, it's, the, the definition is it's a research study that involves one or more human subjects prospectively assigned to an intervention to evaluate these effects of the intervention on an outcome that is medical or biomedical in time. So is this a clinical study you have to ask yourself? Am I doing human participants? If you're doing mice or rabbits or cells or computer programming, it's not a clinical, not a clinical trial. Um, are they being prospectively assigned to an intervention or are you just following people, a cohort? That, that's important. Is the study designed to evaluate the effect of an intervention and is that effect health related? And if you get, answer all four questions, yes, your study will then meet the NIH definition of a clinical trial. Again, it doesn't matter whether your work is or is not. I'm just giving you the, 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 the understanding of what NIH wants you to think about when you're saying I'm doing a clinical trial as opposed to another kind of trial. So we've mentioned, I told you that the NIH consists of 27 institutes and centers. This is the NINDS over here, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. That's where my office sits. Uh, but there are many, many institutes. Uh, the office of the director sits in the middle. Um, the Center for Scientific Research is one of those institutes, but that is the institute that does the uh, review and assignment of your application. So that's not really a research institute. That's a, a sort of a mechanical institute that does the work of review. And so um, you have to figure out where you're going to fit in the NIH application process. Because as I told you, and this is very important, the institute to which you apply will have very different approaches to what grant they want you to use, to your likelihood of being funded, to your approaches, all kinds of things. So you really must figure out early on how, which institute you're going to apply to and which project officer you're going to talk to. Stay tuned, we're going to come back to that. So the work of the staff is that it, it, it informs and it advises applicants. So very often I get emails or phone calls saying, listen, I, I have this idea. I'm not really sure what to do with it. Can you help out? And that's, that's really my job at the NIH. Um, we also manage a portfolio of awards. So I'm managing several awards that have been, that have been um, awarded, several grants that have been awarded, and I'm monitoring their progress. Or we're involved, as I told you, if there are a U mechanism, we're actually involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the particular project. And uh, we monitor the scientific progress made on those grants. So that's the work of the institute staff within each of those 27 centers. Now, Let's go back then to developing your idea. So once you have your idea, whether it's something that you developed out of a clinical question or a mentor suggested it and you thought, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good idea. I hadn't really thought about that, but I like that. Let me pursue it. You have to say to yourself, okay, the, uh, the idea seems a good fit and the NIH seems a good fit. Um, what should I do next? And the next thing I think that you really need to do is get a copy of a successful application that is as close to, but not necessarily completely overlapping with your proposal. And the way that you can look at these things is um, look, at, uh, look at those uh, uh, websites like the NIH Reporter. Um, and um, what's very important here is don't get it original, get it right. So if you can build on somebody's success pro successful application, that is a much stronger way much than just starting from scratch. So what I did, I had, didn't, I had no idea what an NIH application looked like back when I decided to, 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 to embark on this foolhardy process called an R01 application. I had no idea. But I had met somebody who recently was funded for an NIH application. I, I, I'd met this person. Actually, it was Art Kellerman, who's now the dean of the, of the um, uh, Armed Forces Medical School. Uh, and, and he'd been funded on a study looking at progesterone. This is the progesterone for head trauma study. And I wrote to him, I said, listen, I, I, you just got funded for an R01. I have no idea what I'm doing. Can I, can I just see your grant application? Remember, grant applications are privileged. They're not out there in the, uh, for everybody to see, right? NIH doesn't publish them. They publish summaries. But the grant application itself is a privileged document. 
And he very kindly said, sure. Right? I was doing something in kidney stones. His project had been on head trauma, but at least I could see what the grant looked like. What language do you use? How do you structure it? And I would really encourage you, when you're thinking about whatever it is that you're going to apply, if it's applying for a, an SAEM fellowship award, find somebody who's been awarded and ask her, can I borrow your application? You don't need it anymore. You've been awarded, right? Would it be okay? And that way you can see what a winning application looks like. Don't plagiarize, but build on it. And I think this is a very in, good, good tip for um, being able to build uh, and getting some, 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 uh, a leg up. Now, the other thing you need to do is meet with your academic research office. I never really estimated, uh, understood how important this is. Know them early. How many of you have met with your academic research office personnel? How many people have, oh, a number of you. Okay, so under what circumstances had you met with your academic research office personnel? Okay. Did they have to sign off on it before you submitted it? 17 years, this is very, I had, again, you all know this, back in the time I was very naive, your budget, you can't just simply sit in your office, type up a grant application, whether it's a county, whether it's a state, whether it's an, you know, whether it's a pharmaceutical or NIH, you can't simply sit in your office, type it up and press send. It has to go through many layers of, of, of approval, including your academic research office where you only had to get 17 signatures, that's actually a pretty good, uh, that's, that's pretty good. You, you may need to get many more. So please talk to your academic research office as early as you can. Tell them, listen, I'm thinking about submitting this grant. I'm going to submit it in three months. Talk to me about the process. What do I need to do? What do you need from me? Because they will have to sign off on it. And you can't turn up one day before the submission date and say, okay, guys, here it is. You need it to give it to them at least, well, you need to give it to them days, if not weeks before, okay? So talk to them early or you will end up not being able to submit that grant. And they have lots of experience with budget and helping you maybe decide how to, how to figure out the budget. They know how to upload your application. Everything is done centrally through, through a computer, uh, uh, through, through the web. And you really can't move forward without them. When I submitted my NIH grant, there was no computer submission. You had to submit, it was 10 copies. And, and, and it was, you know, I, I was kneeling in my office on the carpet with the photocopies, putting them in stacks. I wish I'd taken a photo of this. Uh, and then putting them into envelopes and mailing them off. That's what we did back then. None of that is, of course, what we do today, thankfully. It saves a lot of trees. It makes it a lot easier. But you do have to get your, um, your academic research office in early to make sure that you will have every success of, of, uh, of, of going forward. And again, without them, you simply can't press send. It won't happen. And then what you need to do is you need to start writing. So you've got, you, you've borrowed, you've, you've requested from a friend or from a colleague or for someone you've never met, but has agreed to lend you or give you their copy of, of their application. Um, and by the way, on the website, uh, of my, my office's website, we have examples uh, of people's applications. These are um, these are awardees who agreed for us to put their application, that privileged research, state, uh, summer, uh, research application, put it on the website so that people can get a sense of what such a thing looks like. So there's an easy place for you to start uh, with that. So you start with your, um, you start writing, assume a much earlier deadline than there will be. My NIH has three, um, typically three dates a year that you can submit. So you need to assume an earlier deadline. Um, usually the research strategy, which is the main part that you'll have to think about as the investigator, that's usually limited to 12 pages. Now there's a lot more that goes into this. There's, um, there, there's all kinds of budget things that will seem very foreign to you. If you haven't done this before, you can get help with this. That's, that's where these uh, academic research offices can, can help. Uh, you will have to submit uh, uh, resumes in a specific uh, format, uh, but the, the, the actual research strategy, the way well, you're going to say, this is what I want to do, this is the question I'm going to answer, and this is how I'm going to answer it, that's usually only limited to 12, limited to only 12 pages. It's not a, it's not a lot there to, to be able to write. Uh, and then you, together with your, um, uh, with your mentors or with your advisors, you build a budget and then you focus on, and then the indirects, which will, as we said, increase the amount of, uh, that you're asking for. 
You build that into your, into your grant proposal. Now, this is very important to understand. You must, early on at the NIH, talk to a project officer, a program official or project officer. These are the people who sit at their desks, answer the telephone, and are involved with advising people. Now, you can technically submit your grant to NIH without having spoken to anybody within the NIH. You can just do it, press send, and it will go. The Center for Scientific Review will get your grant. They will assign it to an institute. Within the institute, it will be assigned to a project officer, and it goes to review. And if it does well, it gets funded. And if it doesn't get that, uh, do well, it doesn't get funded. You can do that. But my advice is do not do that at all. You need to speak to a project officer um, as early as possible for advice. Yes? OK. How do you find, the question was, how do you find the contact information for the project officer? So first you have to go through the reporter, an, an, an NIH reporter, and see who was the project officer on grants that were similar to yours. So if you're doing a project on, 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 on stroke in uh, children, you type those keywords in and you'll find who in the, in the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development has been a project officer on similar grants. It may not have been on stroke, but it may have been on something similar, right? Um, may have been on sickle cell disease in children. And that will give you uh, the first step as to who to contact. So that's a, an important way of doing it. You may have an advice from your colleagues. They'll say, oh, yes, um, I use this person. She's great at NIH, and you contact them. The other thing you can do is just call me, because my job is to help people like you find the right person at NIH. So if you're confused, or you want help, or you just want to talk something through in terms of finding the right program officer, Please contact me, and I will gladly sit with you and think through the options. I'll think, think with you, think through the options. Now, the project officer is extremely important because that person is your advocate at NIH, and we'll see why in a moment. But they can help push your project forward, even if the score was borderline, and they can advocate for you. And if they like you and they like your project, they can actually make the difference between funded and not funded. So please, although you can do this without speaking to anybody at NIH, I strongly advise that you speak to a project officer, talk to them, get a, you know, once you've made contact, this is what I want to do, what do you think, is it within scope, what, what advice would you give me? They can give you all the advice that you ask for up until you submit. They can read through your, if you want them to read through your proposal, they can do that. They might not agree to it, but it's perfectly appropriate for them to read through your proposal. I've done this many times and say, yeah, I think this is good. You might want to tweak this. You might want to change that. It's part of the job. Obviously, once the, once the grant is submitted, it's hands off until the review is, is, is completed. So very important. Talk with your project officer. Figure out which grant mechanism you're, you, mechanism you're going to need to submit through, and I said before that each institute has its own way of doing things. So a grant mechanism at one institute may not be used at another. And so you might pick up the phone and say, hey, I see uh, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences uses this grant application, but I'm doing it in, in an area of something neurological, and NANDS will turn around to you and say, oh, we never use that grant. We don't use that grant mechanism. We use this grant mechanism. You would not have known that, right? Had you, not, had you not actually picked up the phone and spoken with somebody. So figure out your uh, project officer, which mechanism to use. Now, once you've written that research part, the research, 12 page, the research uh, application, have your colleagues read and critique it. Have your peers read and critique it. Have faculty read and critique it, especially if they themselves have done this before. Very important to have them to put a, put a, you know, a set of eyes over it. If you have a spouse, have him or her read it. If you have children who are literate, <laughs> have them read it and critique it. Okay, and, the, and, be, and being serious, because all of these things will help, will help in the process. Okay, you have to be open and say, I need to be edited here. Is this clear? Is it not clear? Where could I be, where could I be stronger? And, and what am I, what am I uh, leaving out? Um, Consider also, I'm just going to pause, becoming an early career reviewer, if you can. Now, the NIH review system is a system where the, where the grant applications are reviewed by whom? Who reviews any grant application you're going to submit? In other words, who scores it? Which can 
consists of your peers, right? NIH staff does not sit and score these things. We have no say, and nor should we have a say, in the, in, the, in the review of the grant and how well it scores. And the people you have to convince are your peers. Other people who are, you know, other emergency physicians, other people in your area, uh, non-emergency physicians in your area. So you have to speak to your peers and convince them, right? So one way of figuring out how this actually works is to sit on a study section and to watch one of these, um, one of these things in, in, in action. Now, there are about 180 separate study sections. You can request one. You, you should request one, actually. In the same way that you should request a specific institute, you should have done your homework and requested a specific study section. 187 of them, of which there are surprisingly few that may actually fit your particular um, area that you're looking into. So the study sections are all um, uh, completely open. You can see who is sitting on them. You can see their area of expertise. You can even sort through previous applications and say, what has this study section funded in the past? Do they like this kind of stuff? Or has, ha, you know, has anything been funded in this? Now, you can't see applications that have been not funded. There's no way that you guys can see any application that's not been funded. You can see every application that has been funded. So you can say, well, what has this study section funded in the past? And if, you're, if you have a project that seems similar or a good fit, that might give you a hint that this is something that I should think about and, and submit to that same study section. Um, you should also, by the way, not in the cover letter that it's changed now, but in the, uh, one of the last sections of the uh, submission form, you will type in the name of the study section, the name of, this, of the grant uh, of the NIH institute that you want, and you can even, and you should even, type in the name of the expertise, not the name of the person, but the name of the kind of the expertise that you are looking for. So if you're doing a study on something to do with head trauma radiology in kids, you probably want an emergency physician or a pediatric radiologist or a pediatric trauma surgeon to review your grant as a, right? So you say, I want this a person with this kind of background. You cannot ask for them by name, but you can ask for what kind of background you need. And if you don't know exactly what you need, again, I'm here to help and think through with you. And what I often have done is called the Center for Scientific Review and said, hey, listen, so-and-so is submitting this grant. She thinks she needs this kind of expertise. Don't worry, I can find you the person. And usually at Center for Scientific Review, they'll say, oh, thank you very much. That'll be very helpful. It's one less thing for them to have to do. They don't have to listen to your request. They don't have to honor your request. They don't have to get somebody with expertise. And I will be honest and say sometimes they don't, and you can suffer as a result. And the, the NIH review process isn't always perfect. But at least you have the opportunity of asking for that person by name. There was a question over here. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, they, they're, they're, they're K award study sections, yeah. I, yeah. I might interject a little bit on the K. So some institutes have a uh, special emphasis panel for their Ks. So NIAID, they would go directly to this, like, you don't request, because if that's the institute it's going to go to, then they have a study section for it. That's unique to Ks, but that also is a, for RFAs, too. So there are certain times where there's been a call, and they're assembling the study section based on that call. So those are the unique circumstances where you don't have much sort of choice yeah. to sort of describe that, but for the most part, in many circumstances, you would submit your K to a specific study section. Yeah, so there are things called special emphasis panels, which are not standing study sections, but are established specifically to review a particular uh, set of grants that are asking, uh, answering a specific proposal. So for instance, when we, sta uh, when we reviewed the SIREN, that's the Emergency Medicine Research Network, jointly funded by NINDS and Heart, Lung, and Blood, when we established that, we put together a special emphasis panel of reviewers to help us review that project because we didn't feel that a, study, a particular standing study section would have been helpful. Another question, yeah. Sure, so that's the um, early career reviewer. Thank you for, for redirecting me, yes. So the early career reviewer is somebody who has really no experience of, of, of being an NIH a recipient of an award, but wants to understand the review process. And there's a, there's a, there's a uh, mechanism by which you can be a, an early career reviewer. Now, these are hard to get because many more people apply for them than there are spaces.
But if you're lucky, you can actually sit in on a review. Reviews are privileged. They're not open to everybody. Nobody can sit on a review except the NIH staff and the, um, and the reviewers themselves. It's, it's, what, what goes on within that is completely private, privileged, uh, and nothing leaks in or out, you know, out of that um, other than the score. So um, that, that's su submitted directly to the PI. The score is not made public either. So you can, what, you can become an early stage reviewer where you will actually sit and have your hand held through the process of being a reviewer. And the reason that this is so fantastic is that you get to read other people's applications. And the best way to write a good application is to read lots of other people's applications. Obviously, these are privileged documents. They need to be uh, kept under lock and key. You can't walk around with them. But you do have the opportunity of reading other people's documents uh, and research uh, submissions. And you can watch the review process in action. Now, later today, we're going to have a mock study section that will give you somewhat of a feel to it. But if you look up early review, um, early career review, and you go to the Center for Scientific Review, you can watch a video of a study section in action. And I suggest that you do. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. I'm not going to spend time t telling you what it's like right now. Maybe we can, we can talk about that later today. But it, it will give you a, a, a real insight into what it is that reviewers do, how they think. Again, there are 180 study sections, each with 12 people or more on them. So there's a vast number of people. So this is, we're not saying everybody thinks this way, right? But it will give you an opportunity to see what happens, and that is really invaluable. So then what, once you've submitted your grant and it's been approved by your, you know, your chair has signed off of it, and the, your research office has signed off on it, and it been, the, the send button has gone, and don't wait till the last minute to send it, because there was, about two years ago, an institution that waited to the last day to send their application in on a fairly substantial one-shot only grant, and their system was down. Not the NIH system, the university system was down, and it came in too late, and they couldn't submit it. True story. Won't tell you where it was. True story. So don't wait to the last minute to submit it. Submit it a few days before. And this is what happens, right? So we've, everything that we've been talking about until now has been focused on this, you know, three to six month period before you actually submit. Uh, and that's when you've been talking to the project officers and done all this other stuff. Then you submit it at uh, month zero. What happens then within a couple of months is that the Center for Scientific Review refers it to an institute. Yes, your grant has been sent to the National Institute for Diabetes and Digestive Disorders. All right? And you may say, great, that's exactly where I wanted it to go. Or you may say, oh my goodness, how did it end up there? That wasn't my plan at all. And it will be um, assigned a project officer. Hopefully you have spoken to that project officer and you're very happy about this, right? And if you haven't, and, you know, and it went to somebody you have no relationship with, that, that might be a problem down the road. So it goes to a project officer, it's referred, then within about four months there is a review, that standing panel of 180 study sections get together, usually in the DC area, but not always, and they spend about two days going through all of the review, all of the, all of the submissions and scoring them. Um, they're reviewed. Um, you then get uh, about two months after the review, you get a summary statement, which is exactly that. It's a statement of the discussion and what the reviewers thought of your grant. Um, if you get a good score, um, it's reviewed by an advisory council, uh, and then uh, meaning that's the NIH um, council. Now that is essentially to think about them as the board of directors of each institute. They consist of uh, again people from uh, peers, academics. Sometimes people, uh, uh, sometimes um, uh, non-medical people, pharmaceutical or lawyers can sometimes be on these things doing civic duty. But think of the board of think of council as the NIH uh, Institute's board of directors. Usually, they approve um, all of the grants without any problem. But clinical, I will tell you that grants that in, that are focused on clinical research and clinical trials get extra scrutiny. So you have another layer. Once it's reviewed, council will want to see those and understand exactly what's, what's being suggested. Um, if council approves, and as I say, usually this happens without any problem, the NIH will, uh, will then make a funding decision and decide to actually award or not award your, um, your grant. If you're awarded, you get the money, away you go, um, and you, you write your, um, your, your yearly um, few paragraphs of what it is that you've done, you send it in, and, 
and you, and you, and you make your career. And if you don't, that's your progress report, if you don't uh, have success, then obviously you can either walk away or reapply. And I will tell you that the key to success, a key to success is to reapply and to reapply and to be, have perseverance. Have perseverance. Try again. You can submit twice the same application and then you have to start again. So if you submit an application twice and don't get funded and you want to do it a third time, you have to tweak it a little bit, maybe change the title, tweak it. But if you submit it the second time, you use the comments of the reviewers to, to improve your application. So you say in your cover letter, we submit our revised application based on the scores and what the reviewers wanted to see. We have changed this. Reviewer one said we needed to do X. We will now do X. Reviewer two, and that's your revised application. It's a much stronger application usually. Much stronger application. So. Not only is it accepted, but I think it's very important to do that. Yes, yes. You absolutely, it could be that the reviewer misunderstood, didn't understand ex exactly what you, what you were saying. So not only may you, but you absolutely should do that. Because otherwise, it may be the same review. Now, hopefully it's the same reviewer the second time who will see your application, realize what you've done, how you've improved it, and hopefully give it a better score. Sometimes the problem is that you've addressed the reviewer one's applications, but by the time it comes up for re-review, that reviewer is no longer on the study section, they've moved off and a new person has come on and now you kind of start all over again, which is a little bit unfair uh, in many ways, but that's the system. So yes, very important to address all of the reviewer's comments, explain why you're changing if you did and why you're not changing anything if you have not. So how are grants scored? Um, there are these five areas, significance, approach, investigators, innovation, environment. To be honest, some of these are silly. I'll be honest with you. Um, Innovation, how innovative are you? I mean, it's very hard to be innovative on a clinical trial, right? Testing drug X against drug Y. You can try different things, but essentially, you know, we do clinical trials in a certain way because they've evolved and that we think that's the best way to do them, right? It's no point saying I'm going to be completely innovative and do things in this completely different way, which is actually a silly way of doing things. But, but innovation is one of the things that you're going to be um, uh, scored on. The environment means your, your, your hospital, your academic center, your university. What support are they giving you? And this is things like what, where, where, where the documents are kept and, and, and you know, how many square foot of lab space you have and all that kind of thing. So that's usually, these are things that you can't really, um, you can't really control. But the significance and the approach and the investigators is really where you can really control things. Because you can say, this is why my project is extremely important. And this is how we're going to do it, and it's going to give us a definite answer. And these are the team, the investigators, and they're an A1 team. You can't get better than these people to help us. That's really where you are selling your research project. So that's very important. Um, they do things in a bit of an upside-down way, meaning the higher the score, the worse the study thought that you were doing. So if you get a score of 9, that's not good. If you get a score of 2, that's fantastic. It's just the way it is. I had no idea why it evolved that way. All right, so high impact, one to three, fair, four to six, and seven, uh, low, seven to nine. Each application is assigned to at least three reviewers who give it a preliminary score. We'll, we'll talk about this later, but they basically, three, three reviewers um, on that study section. You can see the names of all the reviewers. That's public information. You do not know the name of the particular person that reviewed your grant out of those 15 people on the roster. They'll be assigned to three people, at least three people, who, give it a, who read your, your uh, application in depth, give it a preliminary score, and then it's discussed, and then there's a final score. The bottom half of all the applications are not reviewed at study section. So if there are 30 applicants, applications to get through, everybody reads through them, and they're all given a preliminary score. And then the, basically what happens is uh, the bottom half are uh, are basically not discussed. There just isn't time to discuss them. So if you're, you may not be discussed, meaning you don't even get a score. We think that your application was at the bottom half. We didn't even score it, which is very disheartening. And I know because I've been there because that's what happened the first time I submitted my, my, my uh, kidney stone, Tamsulosin grant. It wasn't even discussed. But you do get a summary statement. Everybody gets a summary statement, whether or not you were discussed or not discussed. And so you can use that to improve your grant. Uh, the next time you submit it. 
So as we said, your grant is reviewed, it's discussed or not discussed, and there's a raw score and a percentage, uh, and everybody, as we said, gets a summary statement. Now here, is it possible for you to exit out and just open it? So at this stage, we would have handed out um, a summary statement. It's a summary statement from my kidney stone grant because I told you these are privileged documents. These are not in the general domain. You can ask somebody for theirs if they want to share it with you. But um, uh, you will get a summary statement that looks like this. Okay, fantastic. I think maybe I'll just step up here. And yeah. run. So this is the summary statement that I got. Now look at it. Back in 2005. Um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will tell me that um, it tells you where uh, where it went. So it went to this. Um, let's see why. It's, okay. It went to this uh, urological development and genital ur uh, urinary disease study section. There was no emergency physician sitting on that study section at the time. I think that was a mistake of mine. Um, it tells me what my um, score was. Terrible score. Um, and you can see here, do you see where it's underlined human subjects, SRG concerns? That's the kiss of death. If there are human subjects concerns, meaning the reviewers thought that you were not handling the, the human subjects safely or ethically, that's it. There's, there's nothing else to discuss, right? You're not going to get funded. And they thought that I was doing that to, my, um, uh, to, to, to the patients I wanted to uh, enroll. You can see there's the direct costs for each year. So um, uh, they ballooned pretty quickly after that. But those are direct costs. So on top of that $886,000 that I was asking for over three years, there was another 500 that would have come in to the university. Okay. So. Inclusion of women plan unacceptable. Again, they felt that the way that I was approaching female subjects with, um, um, with uh, uh, kidney stones and randomizing them for tamsulosinot was unacceptable. Why? Because um, I had suggested using steroids, and steroids are teratogenic, right? So I'd suggested putting all the patients either on steroids or placebo. And, and I know that all of you as emergency physicians, when you discharge a patient on 60 milligrams of prednisone for five days because she's an asthmatic, all of you get a pregnancy test, right? Everybody. No, you don't. I know you don't. I know you don't. And you're fibbing if you tell me you do. Right? If they're sitting in the asthma chair over there and they've gotten better and you're, they're ready to go, you're not getting a pregnancy test. You're telling her, you're much better, take your inhaler, Here's, a, here's, a, here's, some, here's a 60 milligrams of prednisone for five days or whatever it is you do and you send them home. Okay, but I was told that that's actually um, uh, not an appropriate thing to do. So um, because of that, um, they didn't like it. They also wrote that the principal investigator, that was me, has limited publication history in the performance of clinical trials. That was absolutely correct. To be honest, I had no publication history in the performance of clinical trials, um, none whatsoever. Uh, again, I was so naive at the time about how to do this that it, it, it's, almost, it's almost sweet how naive I was. Um, so that's what they wrote. Then basically they, they, they copy and paste what it is that you want to do. Then the critiques come, right? There are three different critiques. Again, scoring the way that, um, uh, scoring the way that it's done um, through significance and approach. They actually like what I was doing. They wrote a very well-designed uh, clinical trial. Um, uh, and unless very unexpected results turn up, this trial should be the last one needed to test these drugs for this use. That's great. They're saying you're doing a good job here. We like it. We like your approach. Now, you'll see that different reviewers can have wildly different understandings and approaches to what you did. Some may think this is great. Others may think this is terrible. On the same, on the same summary statement. Same summary statement. So it gets a bit confusing. Okay. They said, well, it's not very innovative. You, you want, and that's okay. I wasn't trying to be innovative. I wanted to do a clinical trial. Um, and again, the investigator, right? I'm trying to sell myself as the principal investigator for this study. Very little research, published very little research, but consulted with many highly experienced researchers in preparing the proposal. I think that's actually a very fair statement of what I was doing. <laughs> very little clinical experience, um, but I did consult with a lot of people. Um, uh, we mentioned that they thought that there was, uh, I didn't exclude pregnant women, so that was terrible. So I have a protection of human subjects plan that's unacceptable uh, and so clearly not discussed. There's no point in discussing a plan that is this terrible. So uh, it was not discussed, but there is at the end the roster of the people in the study section. I have no idea who actually were the three reviewers, 
It could have been somebody from the Department of Biomedical Engineering who doesn't have a clue about what we do with prednisone in the ED. It could have been a professor of urology, uh, a professor of pathology, no idea. Okay, so this is where it's important for us always to make sure that we are um, uh, asked for the right, uh, yeah, if you could just get it back, thanks so much. Okay, so that's what a summary statement looks like. Okay, that's what a summary statement looks like and you use that to build uh, and to improve your score by addressing all the concerns. And so that's what I did when I submitted the second time and it went from a non-discussed uh, project to actually a project that was funded, I think the second time. So that's how it works. Thanks. So, okay, there we go, perfect. So, last few minutes. So once you get a fundable score, right, this is again where the project officer advice really comes out, so pay attention. Different institutes do things in different ways. Many of them say we simply fund in order. The best, the best scoring projects get funded until we run out of money and then we're done. Okay, which is, you could say that's a reasonable way to do it, right? Best funded projects, get the money. When we run out of money, we stop funding. That's perfectly reasonable. So here, for instance, is what the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease says. It says the most important factor is the impact, scientific impact, as judged by peer reviewers. In other words, your score. Um, NIAD awards most investigator initiator um, applications in strict order by percentiles. So the score is translated into a percent. And the better your percentage score, the more you will the more likely you'll be funded up until we run out. And usually it's around 15%. So the top 15% get funded. If you're the 17th percent, you're the 17th best study in terms of your percentage, you won't get funded because they ran out of money at 15. Sorry, does that mean you had a bad study? It was a bad application? Not at all. It was a great application. It was fantastic. But it just didn't get to that cutoff. By the way, is there a meaningful difference between a, a 15th percentile score and a 17th percentile score? None whatsoever. And this is actually, we've done, there have been peer-reviewed studies, looked at this, published studies, that show there is no difference in terms of all kinds of outcomes between a study that gets a 15 and a study that gets a 17 or an 18. But you need some system, okay? So, um, look at what they also say. After they say we, we, we fund in terms of, of scores, Selective pay enables NIA to fund a small number of programmatically important applications. Program officers nominate, select, nominate selective pay applications. The people you called up on the phone, they say, listen, we're funding up to 15th percentile. This got an 18, but it is a great project. I don't have any of these in my portfolio. I think she's a great PI. I think that the, the, the summary statement maybe didn't quite understand the, the, the significance. I really think we should fund this. That's where your project officer comes out to bat for you and that's why you must have the support of a project officer if you're going to do this seriously. Um, here's NIGMS, General Medical Sciences. After review, we meet to discuss and recommend which um, application should be funded. It's mainly driven by the availability of funds and initial peer review. However, they say at NIGMS. However, many other factors are taken in consideration including study section, council's advice, uh, application of status as a new or established investigator uh, and so on. And so they say we look at a range of applications on either side of the pay line, that's the cutoff, and POs, project officers recommend the level of funding, making budget adjustments on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, please be on good terms with your project officer. She can't accept a gift of more than $18 without having to report it in the federal system, so you can send her a gift to try and persuade her to take on your project, but you can't send more than $18 worth of a gift without her having to report it. Uh, so, examples of pay lines. Here's NANDS. Up to the 15th percentile, everybody gets funded. Up to here, everybody's funded. Beyond here, no one's funded. And then you've got this kind of gray zone in the middle where some of them are funded and some of them are not. And that's where you are really trying to focus on uh, the project officers trying to help you. Same with NHLBI, I'm not going to read the, the thing here, but again, depending on the availability of funds, the Institute will make funding decisions on competing applications above the pay line, that means actually worse, uh, through selective pay. So most institutes will tell you this. Here's the, here's the percentiles that you, will, that you will have. So NHLBI says for an R01, you need to be 15th percentile or better, but for an early stage investigator, 25. That's a huge thing. So 
an early stage investigator gives you an extra, usually an extra 10 points or so if you can get it. Which means that if we go back to this percentile thing, which means that if your study was a 25, but you're an early stage investigator, you get an extra 10 points. So you now get 15, so you're now funded. That is huge. How do you become an early stage investigator? The computer will tell us, and the NIH system will tell you, put in all the information, and it will tell you whether or not you're an early stage investigator. Essentially, you have to be within 10 years of a terminal degree, not having been a, project, a, a principal investigator on a previous R01 uh, or a previous U grant and so forth. But you can have been on, a, on, on other grants. Okay, you kind of had a K award, for instance. So people often write to me and say, I, I, am I an early stage investigator or not? And the answer is, I don't know. Put it into the system and, and it will tell you. Uh, and it's really important that you use this to your advantage um, because it can make all the difference. 10 point difference is huge. Um, so you have to be within 10 years, I said, and not yet funded. Um, the clock starts after fellowship. And as I say, you update your ERA Commons profile, that's the NIH profile that you must have in order to submit a grant, and um, really take advantage of that. We mentioned the uh, important role of the project officer. Um, once you get your summary statement, check back with your project officer and say, well, what do you think? You were in the review. What, 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 what was actually the feeling? Is this fair? What do you think I should do? Should I have a go again? Um, how should I change it? Very important feedback there. Um, and so they can become an additional source of insight into the discussion in the room. Council, as I said, meets three times a year. They're the board of directors. They usually just agree. We're funding all these, no problem. But sometimes they may not concur, especially if it's a high profile or a very um, contentious or possibly um, it could expose the NIH to certain uh, risks. They may, um, they may, uh, question something, and, and, and the other thing they can do is, you as, a, as, a, as an investigator can write a letter, if you don't like the score that you got, if you think that you were fundamentally not understood, or you think they got something wrong, like I don't think that 60 milligrams of prednisone for five days requires all patients to get a, a all, women, all female patients to get a pregnancy test, I don't think you understood the dangers there. I could write that, right? And I could ask for a formal review. Now, I, you can do this. And at most, what you'll get is you, they will re-review your application. But I don't really recommend this in most, in most instances, because really what you want to do is take the application, take the summary statement, do a better job next time, and go forward. But council can redress real or apparent errors in review. And so if you don't get funded the first time, you need to revise and submit and revise and submit. I'm here to help. I know I'm from the government and I'm here to help is not really something that goes away. But I really am here to help. Uh, I enjoy doing this. It's what I do every day. And um, I know a lot of people within the system. It, NIH is a very big place, but on the other hand, there's only a relatively small number of places that our grants tend to go. So yes, there are some emergency medicine applications that go to the National Institute of Deafness and Craniofacial, uh, uh, craniofacial something. Right, there are, but the majority of our grants go to heart, lung, and blood, neurology, uh, and um, uh, probably uh, aging or, or child health and human development. Those are the sort of the three or four big ones, and most likely to be the places that you will think about going. But I do know people across the NIH, and I'm happy to connect them with you, and I look forward to talking to you uh, informally. Good luck with the application, and remember, remember if you don't, if you don't try, you won't get it, and uh, you will succeed because unlike the craps table, this is about perseverance and about uh, doing, be, being smart and about using your, your skill sets to persuade other people uh, what a great researcher you are, so thank you.
I will, I will reiterate the sort of revise and resubmit uh, with a personal anecdote. So I submitted my K four times, and my scores actually, when you plot them, got worse until the last one. Uh, so some of that is because it's a different reviewer, some of it different study section, but they went uh, 32, 39, 45, 10. So it, revise and resubmit is, is a real thing. You will learn. It's a learning process, and it gets better, and, and you will be successful, right? It's shots on goal is essentially what you're talking about here. So all right, well, we're running just a smidge late, but let's take a 10-minute break, sort of get a biological break in here. We'll come back. We'll start working on specific games and uh, go from there, okay?